if the realtor wasn't between the public and the government, there would be substantially less private property. PPAR gives us access to all these people and that's super valuable to your business that you never would have been able to get in front of. She was just like, you don't have to rent to families and people with kids. I'm like, yes, you do. I was like, yeah, you get rich robbing banks too, I guess, but that's illegal. If our industry is under attack, you are under attack. The people that I work for and serve, and that's a huge problem. Yeah, and I don't think real estate is bad. It's just not perfect for everybody all the time. People often think they made money on a house because they bought it for three and sold it for four. And I'm like, well, yeah, but you had a loan. You paid 50 grand in interest. How much property taxes and insurance did you pay? Oh, that's right, you painted that wall, made this cool geometric thing on it, slapped a roof on it, concreted it. You made what we call zero dollars. Welcome back to Altitude Agents. I am Kyle Wong, your 2024 PPAR YPN Chair. And I'm Nakari Wright, your 2024 YPN Co-Chair. And this is our very special guest, Daniel Muldoon. Yay. All right. Thanks who, for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you. Um, who the heck are you? Well, like you said, I'm Daniel Muldoon. I am a past YPN PPAR Chair, and I'm the current Colorado Association of Realtors YPN Chair for 2024. Cool. Awesome. How'd you get into that? Well, in 2019, I think it was, I did the Colorado Association of Realtors Leadership Academy. Jason Witt, who's the current chair, was also in the Leadership Academy group. He's now um, the car president, and he appointed me to the YPN chair for 2024. Okay. Nice. Huh. Hmm. Did you have any desire when you first got into YPN? I'm going to circle back to that a little bit later. But when you first got into the local chapter at PPAR, our YPN, did you have any intentions of being where you are now? No. I didn't even have intentions of getting involved with this YPN at the time. <laughs> did you even know that one existed? Because uh, I personally did not. Gosh, so thinking back that many years ago, I did know that the CAR YPN existed because there were quarterly calls. So when I was the YPN chair for PPAR, I participated in some of those calls, all of them. Let's just say all of them because I was an A student. So I participated in all of the calls. <laughs> yes. And I went to several of the CAR YPN events. But when I got started at PPAR YPN, before I was the chair, I don't know if I knew that there was a state organization at that time. So okay, okay, nice. Um, well, wait. I feel like we got a little bit ahead of ourselves. Let's go back and let's get into your background and how you got into YPN in the first place. How you, your career? Yeah. How many years was that exactly? You said that many years back. It's, it's probably been like twelve, or at least ten oh or so twelve. There are children younger than that. Or fourteen years ago. I can't remember exactly. Um, whenever PPAR YPN was founded, I was sort of there at the beginning. The founding members of the PPAR YPN, um, Did elected. Patrick drag you in? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so before my brother was chair, like 10, 12 years ago, the folks who were chairs before him convinced him to come. Then he tricked me into coming. <laughs> and then from there, we had a really great community of YPN friends and have spent over a decade now in the YPN things. Okay. So, okay. so nice. what kept you along then? I mean, getting dragged into something is one thing, but there are things where you're just like, oh, this is fun. I enjoy this. This is great. But what kept you going and then now involved at the capacity that you are? Yeah, good question. So I think YPN was a springboard for virtually all the leadership that I've been involved in. We've heard that before. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think it's important that everybody gets involved. So I have the same question that everybody does when somebody tries to convince you to come to YPN. Why would I hang out with a bunch of realtors who are my competitors? It just doesn't make any sense. And what I found out was like th the best thing I could have done was be involved with realtors who are allegedly my competitors, i.e. now my very good friends, yeah. um, for a multitude of reasons. And I just saw a lot of value in it. Like we had a lot of fun. We had a really good group. Everybody was really engaging. Um, and consistent and we had great events that were being put on and so it kept my interest and um, 
from there, it's just been pivotal really in my career and uh, all the friendships that I have with the folks from YPN, and we're still hanging out many, many years later. It's just so funny you say that because I think that's verbatim exactly <laughs> what Patrick, what Patrick said. Yeah, He's well, like springboard, pivotal, right. exactly. all those things. Okay. I was like, Keyword. good. God, that's well, I often like say right. that he's the successful brother, so I just stand on his <laughs> coattails, you know, and he just Whatever takes he me along. Just right, yeah. yeah. It's just easy to just stand right there. So he probably gave me that script at some point in my career, and I've just run with it. That sounds about right. Um, that's so funny, though. So, okay, so YPN as a springboard, I yeah. guess, now go back to where you were in your business pre-YPN. You get involved, you show up, you realize, hey, there's actually value here. I'm meeting people. It's good. Now, what are you involved in currently? And then how would you say the progression has come along the way? Because in my personal experience, when I, I kind of got, I don't know if dragged is the right word. It wasn't drudgery, but I got pulled into YPN. Somebody convinced me, oh, free drinks, dude. The social's cool. And like, you'll meet people. Great. And then I showed up. I actually started connecting and learning with people. I gleaned a lot from those who had a lot more experience than me, which was awesome. And then somehow it turned a corner, and then I started to share experience and teach things to newer agents, which was even cooler. Um, but now I see being a part of Leadership Academy, seeing into public policy and stuff, how it has been a springboard. How would you say that progression has been from here, from then to here? Yeah, so I did virtually nothing until YPN. I had zero engagement in the realtor brand, um, and then started very loosely learning about it mm -hmm. as YPN. Um, that was also probably the first thing I put on my resume for anything else. So from YPN, community relations is another committee that's a PPAR. So we had a lot of involvement with community relations. Yeah, they're pretty um, closely tied. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of overlap between the two of them. So using those things, then that shot me into Leadership Academy. And the PPAR Leadership Academy... I want to say I did in like maybe 15, 14 or 15. Okay. And that little checkbox on my resume um, did two things. One, it opened my eyes to how hard people work around PPAR and RSE. Yeah. And many of the members who are, are winning because of the work that people do here while they're out yeah. closing real estate and not being involved whatsoever mm. are generally the most critical people of what's going on here as well. So we encourage them to get involved so that they can see that it's not just a bunch of couch potatoes mm -hmm. doing nothing but stealing their membership dues. Like there's lots of really great people doing really great things, and they ought to be a part of it. Yeah. Um, so between Leadership Academy here, that led me into Leadership Pueblo, which was uh, um, basically a similar thing but learning about the government of Pueblo. And uh, at the time, I think I lived in the city of Pueblo. Now I live in Pueblo County, but nonetheless – um, that then allowed me to get accepted through the application process to Leadership Academy for the Colorado Association of Realtors. Was that arduous or? Um, yeah, I mean, each one of them required the other one, in my opinion, to get to. Gotcha. So like. So it was like a little ladder. Definitely, yeah, because I also did some leadership stuff at the Pueblo Association of Realtors with their YPN over 10 years ago. Um, Patrick and I were involved there as well. And um, so, yeah, each one of those things like, I don't think Leadership Pueblo would have accepted me if I didn't have Leadership Academy here. And I don't know if Car Leadership oh. Academy would have accepted me if I didn't already have Leadership Pueblo and Leadership Academy here. Gotcha. Um, because, like, as you grow in those entities, it's more competitive. At the time with Leadership Academy at Car, I think we had two applicants for every available position um, hmm. because they limited to, I don't know, whatever the number is, 20, 30 people, something like that. Sure. And so they have 50, 60, 70 applications and they go through and, you know, like the things that you've done in the past help determine if they're going to take you on or not. So um, it's just like politics. It kind of is, you know, and like each of those things has built on itself. And now I volunteering is probably one of the most important things in my business. Yeah. And it's where we market our business is in our volunteer stuff. And I was a little bit different because I was never – uh, like huge into real estate sales. I've done mostly property management my whole career. Mm -hmm. uh, I did, and I am competent and capable to do sales, but it's just not my passion. So it was good for me because I met a lot of sales agents who didn't have property management experience. And so like I do today, people call me all the time. I have a question. Can you help me? Yeah. Um, and those conversations happen a lot at YPN and many of those people refer me business. So there's some benefit to that as well. But 
Um, even just knowing the person, like if I called you and there was another agent who called you or you and said, I got an offer and you knew me, you would probably be like, well, hopefully after this amount of time, <laughs> you know that I could get the deal done. Cause I tell you I can, and you've experienced that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if they were competing identical offers, the likelihood of my people getting it, mm -hmm. uh, is greater. So it's a benefit to your client and it's, uh, something that you can sell yourself to your clients on. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, many times people ask like, why should I hire you? And it's like, well, I care about my community. I'm involved here. I do this, that, and the other thing. And those are important. So like by you hiring me, it allows me to perpetuate these things. And I'm not just show up, grab a commission, you know, one night stand, you're out the door onto the next one. Hmm. You know, this is a thing I invest my time and my resources. I'm away from my family or my friends to do right. this. Something we believe in. Yeah, exactly. So I think it, and I think that shines through to your customers and your clients. It creates a different level of professionalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Cause you can speak to them about things that people who are not involved in this cannot. And I think that shines through. So I definitely think it makes an impact both just knowing the realtor, but then also bringing that knowledge back to your client. Yeah, I think something you touched on, which is kind of the theme of what you were saying about not getting into it necessarily for like, what's my ROI? What am I going to get out of this? How many deals have I closed from YPN? Uh, which of course, especially when you're new and you're newer in your business, you have to protect your time, you have to protect your money, you have to be wise with the way you spend your resources. But ultimately, it's, it's kind of like you said, it's the volunteerism, it's the aspect of giving back to your community. And people say that so much, especially in our industry, relationships, relationships, relationships. Yeah. It's like, is it really a relationship when you're still concerned about what your dollar back is going to be? And so I think that's one of those things where getting into YPN, I could tell you all the day long that it's going to be a benefit to your business because it's true. We've seen it. We've heard it. We know it. We experience that not just in the fiscal value, um, but also in the unquantifiable value of having those resources, having that access, having those relationships. Um, but ultimately, it just goes back to you need to get into it and get involved in your community, but specifically your YPN, your people who are most similar in your business, because you can see things, you can learn things, you can just through diffusion, uh, pick up on things uh, that eventually will get you paid. Yeah. And again, I don't think you should go into it with that mindset. But like, Yes, we are going to bring a lot of value to you, but what are you going to bring to your community? Because people need you. You're unique. You have your own value proposition to your clients, to your market, to your network, and that's equally as important. Because some people, like you said, as as uh, YPN is a springboard, some people will go into leadership academies. Some people will go up the, I guess, the political level, if you will. Uh, but some people go off into ch tangential groups, so like community relations, and they become super successful and involved there. And that's equally as important, if well, not more so. How else are you going to keep this machine going if not for new blood? Yeah. Like the yeah. old farts, they're done with it, man. <laughs> they put in their time in the dirt. They, they need some younger ones to show up, carry the torch, yeah. learn about it now. Because as you guys have learned, it's a very complex mechanism. Yeah. You know, from the outside looking in, it doesn't really feel like that. But for anybody who thinks that they can't get any value out of YPN, they are probably so far superior to everybody that they can give their value back to YPN. Mm. So it takes both, you know, mm. it's like exactly. get what you can because you need it and then give back to it because you can. And yeah. it's like, even if you weren't involved in YPN, um, I say it sort of tongue in cheek because I don't think anybody can show up in YPN and not get something out of it. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. even if you only get free fried pickles down the street, <laughs> let's go. Oscar you know, Blues. Right. You're getting something out of it. Um, but also you can bring something to it. And there's a lot of, you know, connections to be made and, and, and where else can you go and get free knowledge from the county assessor? Mm, um, you know, yeah. like who, what other guests have you, the mayor probably planning, came in, yeah, planning department's yeah. been mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. you know, like all those yeah. people come in and tell you everything you need to know. These would be about, paid classes or courses anywhere else. If you could even get access to them. Exactly. Like, yeah. yeah, call the assessor and see if he'll show up for an hour in your office. Or <laughs> right. she. You know, exactly. I don't remember who won the most recent election up here. but Yeah, um, that's a great point, actually. I don't think we highlight enough, like, the access we have, especially from Clarissa Thomas, because she alone is incredible, but she gives us access. PPAR gives us access to all these people that when you think about it, it's just like, oh, I'm showing up for a monthly meeting. It's like, no, you're showing up in front of a person that's super valuable to your business that you mm -hmm. never would have been able to get in front of. Yeah, exactly. And you learn a lot of like vendors. Yeah. I mean, you have what, one or two monthly yep. sponsors. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're learning home inspectors and 
assuming that you're either young in the business or young at heart or young in age or whatever, like these are things you probably don't have built out yet. Right. So, you know, what banks will lend to your buyer who has a single wide? I, I don't know, but they're probably going to sponsor YPN at some yep. point. Yeah. You know, what home inspector is decent? You can open up the proverbial yellow pages and pick any number of them, but which proverbial. one's less stupid? And, you know, it's like, <laughs> fine, find that one or have multitudes yep. of them. Yeah. Exactly. So I think those connections are really important, especially for people who are newish or newer in the business. Yeah. yeah. And the knowledge is just amazing. There's been so many times where I've won clients from something that I've learned at YPN. And even like the day before, and I'm just saying, oh, I heard that. I'm just going to repeat what I heard this guy say. Or I'm mm -hmm. just going to repeat what I heard this girl say. I've won clients doing that. Yep. So the value is just, mm. there's, I feel like there's not anyone who's going to walk away with nothing. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well, and I don't think your clients care how many homes you sold. I don't think they care yeah. that you show up in a cool, fancy car. I think probably yeah. the opposite, actually. Most people are struggling. Mm -hmm. Show up in a $300,000 Bentley looking cool. <laughs> You know, they don't look hungry. Like, why am I going to have you close my house? You're already yeah. doing fine, you know? So yeah. um, I think it's nice when you you are the product that you're selling mm -hmm. and to just be able to tell them, hey, I was just Oof. involved in this thing and I heard from this person who you don't have access to and you say, oh, I had a meeting with exactly. the county assessor yesterday. You know, and the assessor yeah. was telling us, here's what his property taxes are doing. Exactly. So Mr. Buyer, Mr. Seller, be prepared because your prices on your um uh, Taxes are going to go up 200 bucks a month next year. And they're like, well, I didn't even consider that. Yeah. And you're right? a super genius. Well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Right. And now I know everything. Yeah. Exactly. Now I'm yeah. the expert. Yeah. It's, you show up like, I sold 50 homes. They're like, they're like okay. Awesome, dude. Cool. I'm just going to make you me? that much more rich. Right. Exactly. 51. Like, you're just another right. notch in the belt. Yeah. Right. Like, I, I keep bringing this up as an example because I think it's such a great example. But this whole wildfire homeowners insurance issue that we've been seeing specifically in the foothills, specifically in Black Forest Monument, places like that. Um, these are things that while it did happen suddenly, we had a lot of foreknowledge on that because of people that we had brought in giving us the forecast, giving us the, hey, we as industry professionals, specifically in insurance, uh, this is what we see coming down the pike. And so we can now relay that to our clients and just say, hey, heads up, if you are an owner in this area, this is something you should be looking out for. Might be a higher insurance bill. Might be, um, what do they call it, non, um, basically non-renewals. Mm -hmm. um, or if you're a buyer, hey, just a heads up, while we're in, in the under contract process, this might be something we want to look out for. These are the things that are super important that if you're just sitting alone in your own office and never talking to anybody, you know, oh, I'm busting out, I'm doing these deals. That's awesome. All you're doing is getting face to face with clients. But when are you getting face to face with other experts in the industry? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and how much more value could you bring by having some other information like exactly. you were just talking about? You know, it's like, yeah, that is the difference between making your client money and losing a money. If you know exactly. what insurance is going to do tomorrow or what interest rates are going to do tomorrow and the other person doesn't, you know, those are things that become very important. And like exactly. I think you said, you yeah. had Tony DeLacio on or will. Mm hmm. You know, like you, I would not know Tony if it wasn't for YPN. Like we've right. been homies Same. for the yeah, whole time during YPN. Yeah. And anytime you need to know something, he'll tell you, oh, insurance companies are collecting a dollar for every, a dollar in premiums for every dollar and seven cents they're paying out in claims. Yeah. What does that mean? You can't function at a deficit. So at some point, that 7% difference has got to be made up somewhere. And they're going to find out Colorado has freaking hail damage all the time. <laughs> and they're going to quadruple your rates. Exactly. And so it's like. Well, thanks, Tony. Would have had no idea any of that was yeah. coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my clients are calling me saying, why'd my payment go up? Because mm -hmm. they have no idea what their uh, escrow accounts are. You know, they have no idea that taxes and insurance are paid yeah. on their behalf. And they're like, well, you told me this was a fixed rate mortgage. My payment went up 150 bucks a month. Yeah. And like, yeah, let me help you out with yep. that. Yeah, and I see that a lot, especially with out-of-state clients. They they tend to get surprised by the cost, both on the low and the high side of certain things. Like people moving from Hawaii are like, wow, your property taxes are so cheap. People moving from Florida or I'm sorry, uh, like Texas are like, why is your insurance so high? Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, on, on both sides, having that knowledge is super important. But yep. um, I guess tying that back in then. So you at the state level at YPN, I think at this point, a lot of people understand the value of the Pikes Peak Association of Realtors, why having the local community in your area that you serve with the people that you see at the grocery store every day, mm -hmm. why that's important. But why does that matter at the state level? And then what even is the Colorado Young Professionals Network? How does that tie in? Yeah, so um, the state issues are state issues. It'd be very hard for PPAR to play at the state level because they're a local association. 
So like Colorado Association of Realtors deals with those things. So any state laws that are coming down the pike that have anything to do with private property rights, anything to do with with the realtor brand, so any licensing. Mm. Um, Which is important right now, specifically. Yeah, yeah. insurance, so like e and insurance stuff. That's all lobbied by Colorado Association of Realtors. You can't really, I mean, you can lob- lobby locally and you get maybe some municipal code, but law is done at the, the state level. So yeah. having that there is extremely important. And, you know, some people just have different passions and sometimes you grow out of it. Like, you know, we've been in the local YPNs for a long time. It's great to see young, competent folks coming up behind us. I'm not going to be, any, let me I'm know. not going to be the OPN <laughs> hanging out there, you know, yeah. forever. It's like, yeah, we'll show up, we'll have fun, but the leadership's got to change sure. and the state's no different, you know? And as you've seen, uh, you have what, four or 5,000 members at PPAR. I think during my tenure, there was five, 600 of them that were like in the age group and, or the experience wow. level. And we were getting 20 mm-hmm. at a monthly meeting. So it's like okay. very little engagement for what should be yep. and the state experience is the same thing we have thirty thousand members you know they got a hundred some odd committees or something like that or dozens at least mm-hmm. and maybe maybe ten percent no probably not probably like five percent of people maybe yeah. the state membership were involved there so it's a good stepping stone because at some point there's just things because the three-way agreement between nar car and ppar there's going to be some things where maybe you want to try to make an impact for your local association to the state level, where you want to have a voice for your local association at the state level. Because CAR is basically made up of representatives from each of the local boards. Yeah. Right. So it's like <clears throat> you've done what you're going to do mm-hmm. here. Time to shoot up to there. And YPN is similar. Um, so the the advisory group, which we started in in 24, which is a continuation of the 2023 um, uh, uh, CAR chair. YPN chair. And basically the advisory group is made up of the local YPN. So PPAR has a seat at the table. DMAR has a seat at the table. We have, oh. we have, uh, at large. So if your association doesn't have a YPN, you can still have a voice at the state level. And really what I've worked to do in 24 with the staff at CAR is, um, create CAR basically as a support for the local associations. So it's not a competitive thing. I don't want to come to PPAR and, and solicit events at PPAR for CAR. But if PPAR right. has yeah. an event, we want to tell everybody in the state about it. So it and, travels up. Oh, okay. And we can do that at the state level. So okay. um, the objective is to support the local associations and complement the local associations as much as we can and not compete against the local associations, which as you get more involved, you'll s- see that some local associations um, do or don't like the state association or the national association, Sure, like where those lines collide, there's, there can be some rubs sometimes, but I think being respective of the boundaries is, is helpful. And, um, knowing the CAR has its, its own dynamics and it's not trying to usurp the local associations yeah. from the YPM perspective at any point in time, I think is important. So, you know, as, um, you guys and others grow out of your local associations. I think you should always be involved there, even if not a YPN, but there might be some state issues that you're really passionate about, mm-hmm. you know, like 1031 exchanges, which is actually federal. So that'd be NAR's battle, but maybe you're, you're interested in keeping 1031 a thing, you know, and you want to be, you at the table be for, for in real right? estate, right? For policy yeah. at NAR, there's a lot of policy at, at CAR. So those things, um, just give you a place to go. I'm a firm believer that like, leaders are leaders you know you have to give them the environment but somebody who doesn't want to do it you can't make them do it yeah and the people who do want to do it you just got to give them the avenues to do that Mm -hmm. and ypn is a great place to like explore that sandbox to be like what does this look like and ppar has probably one of the best structured ypns in the state so there's a lot of staff support um the machine is already there that could be good or bad you know, when you have a ship that's bigger, sometimes it's harder to steer. It takes longer to do it, mm-hmm. but it it's also stays it. online, you yeah. know, and you don't have a lot of peaks and valleys. Like you guys exactly. are strong leaders, but if you find somebody who's not the, at least YPN will still be doing its thing. We'll yeah. yeah. Right. And you won't see these like peaks and valleys yeah. of like Kyle and Akari killed it. And we membership is up. And then Daniel came in and killed it. And nobody shows up. And now yeah. we got to rebuild this thing. Yeah. And it just keeps going up and down. Yeah. So. Okay. Because I remember one of our 
earlier meetings is actually when we were getting into the role of 2024 chair and co-chair uh, talking through exactly that. So first of all, what is Colorado YPN? Um, how are how are we going to be working together? Because, I mean, it really is a silly thing to be like, oh, we're, we're competing. And it's like, I don't need anything from you. You don't need anything from me. There's no like nothing like that. We can both benefit from each other, I believe. And you having your past experience teaching us a lot of the nuance and, and ways that we can run this better mm -hmm. by both taking advantage of, like you said, the big machine that's well oiled, things going already, while also still adding to that, right? Because we don't want to just be like the figureheads, if you will, and just right. the faces and just, oh, we don't really do anything. We just kind of show up and like we're here for 2024. Uh, we still want to have our impact and our value add and do what we do. And you talking us through that and most recently talking through um, a lot of the ways that CYPN uh, really nurtures leaders, which is another topic I want to talk about, which I think is so important because part of, like you said, being a, a good leader is bringing up other leaders and training other people to train other people. Mm -hmm. And so part of this is, yes, we, we do our roles and we do what we do and – um, I'm really happy to do that, but also who's going to replace us? We're not going to be here forever. You're not going to be here forever. And so having that eye and that discernment to bring up other people behind you is so important. And so you guys being involved by um, working to get uh, stipends and sponsorships for uh, leadership events and ways to educate ourselves, uh, I just so, so appreciate. So that was something I thought was super cool. Yeah, that worked out well this year. That was kind of a continuation of some goals for 23 that we were able to carry into 24. So we gave some money towards <clears throat> two board chairs. I think it was two. Don't quote me on that. But to go to the NAR, um, YPN Advance, I think they call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was In Chicago. Cool. In Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. And, I mean, I think it's like a great event. And I wish everybody would go that was incoming chairs and everybody was engaged because um, you meet a lot of really cool people and really great experiences. And so that was, that was neat. I was glad we were able to do that. Now we have some sponsorship money. So if PPAR is doing an event, we can sponsor that and, and help oh, and nice. then help promote it as well at this, at the state. So yeah, um, that was another way. That There's actually a new thing. Well, first of all, pickleball tournaments. Mm -hmm. I will literally never say no to a pickleball tournament. I freaking love pickleball. Good. I will never not, talk about how much I love pickleball. It's actually insane. Talk about um, it some more. Yeah, so, keep going. We'll so, just call this a there, pickleball right? podcast. There's so that. Thing. Um, I don't know why I just got really into that. <laughs> um, that doesn't matter. But that would be a cool event. The second thing. So are you going to the pickleball tournament I think the Loveland is putting on? The uh, Loveland YPN, I think it is. I don't know if I'll be able to make it. It's a little bit of a drive for me. That would Didn't be really awesome. Didn't you just awesome. tell me I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. Go to pickleball yeah. Hold on, hold on, no, hold on. Fine. Okay, there, there is that. But totally my idea. I just came up with this having a do realtors have talent event. Yeah, I think would be so you should cool. Do that. You should yeah, do like that. a talent show. Yeah, maybe even some something weird like somebody shows up with a nose. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. Like, you, never know, oh yeah. you never know. Oh my god. You never know what realtors can do. <laughs> it's crazy, dude. Yeah, definitely did not talk about that off camera just <laughs> yeah. beforehand. No. Um, but something like that, I think, would be really fun because, of course, you know, being young in the business, it's like. It is a little intimidating not having those established relationships because some of the vets that have been around for years are like, oh, my gosh, like you were there when my son was born. And people are just like, okay. I just met you last week. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess breaking the ice is really important for us in that age group. Yeah. 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 And I, I mean, even when I started coming to YPN, there was some level of intimidation. My brother has been in the business for 10 years longer than me. He's been way more public facing. You know, he does deals with way more brokers than I ever did. Yeah, he talks a lot to broke. I mean, talks a lot to brokers, you know, just not just general, talks a lot just... with a period. But um, and so like the name recognition, he knew these people. I had no idea at the time who Derek Wagner, like D Wag and I are homies now. Yeah. But he's like, oh, it's Derek Wagner. I'm like, cool. OK, great. <laughs> Hi. Good to meet you. <laughs> what does that mean? No idea. But, um, yeah, so, you know, but everybody kind of knows everybody. And I don't think more than maybe one meeting did anybody feel like they were out of place because yeah. like, you know, who hasn't been at your table before, you mm -hmm. know, exactly. and if you're sitting in your conference room and some newbie comes in, you're like, yep. but in the water, let's talk to that <laughs> one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're like, Oh God. Right. So who I think it's are good. You? Yeah. And same at the social events, like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. who hasn't been there. And I found that the realtor community has been very engaging. 
super helpful and like, hey, who are you? Haven't seen you here before. Oh, cool. Yeah, this is so and so and so and so. And yep. instantaneously, they got fifty new friends. So yeah. Yep. Hmm. Cool. But I'm glad you guys are there and doing the things that you're doing. What are the plans for 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 PPA RYPN? Ooh, that's a great oh, question. Do you want to take question. that? Nope. No. Okay, cool. Am I not allowed to ask questions because I'm the podcast? <laughs> That's e? it. Cut, the cut. Podcast podcast e? E? <laughs> no, actually, I really like when guests ask questions. Um, I just, so when That's we went into this initially, I think you were actually one of the first people we talked about this in depth with just because we didn't feel like we had that direction so much. We had a desire, but not so much, like you said, the avenue to accomplish or acquire that. One of the big things was, I do agree, and I do believe that PPAR, especially YPN, has such a great thing going. Mm -hmm. Ever since I have been a part of it, I had done nothing but learned, done nothing but gained, done nothing but built a business often off of those referrals, those relationships, and just the, the knowledge that I had acquired for my personal business where I had benefited personally. I was like, I've done nothing but get from this. Mm -hmm. And so it's 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 cresting a corner where I would really like to give back wherever I can. And so uh, kind of started smaller scale where I was attending multiple uh, meetings for various committees and communities. And that was awesome because I just got more and more and more. And then slowly as I got, because I didn't want to just show up and start blabbing and being like, here you go, I'm helping. I'm not. It would be better for me to just learn from other people. And then as I acquired the knowledge, I can share. But things like the uh, annual white PN Halloween party, mm -hmm. right, which was a continuation of the white party or the rooftop party mm -hmm. uh, for those who are around for that. And that was really cool to see just how an event is planned, right? How do you make those calls to events? Uh, how do you make reservations for spaces how do you call these vendors how do you get sponsors for an event now you know why people get paid for that stuff it is exactly. yeah i'm like this is and, and a that's the thing it was yeah. all volunteer work yeah everybody every single person showed up for that meeting at that table mm -hmm. for free yeah. and they took time out of their day they took time out of their businesses answering phone calls for clients right there doing what they needed to do just to help the community and guess what we we raised thousands of dollars for charities yeah. mm -hmm. and it is such a cool thing that we had fun we put in work but it benefited our community in a very real way. Um, and I just thought that was so cool. Like, where else do you find people that are so committed to do stuff like that for free? Yeah. You know, honestly. Because yeah. people, people, people honestly give real estate agents a bad rep, uh, but realtors have been some of the most committed people, some of the most endearing, selfless people. I've seen people on the other side of deals who are like, dude, I know I'm going to take a loss on this commission, but, like, I'm just going to do this to make it work for my client. Right. Dude, I really respect you for that. Like, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, and there's so. not enough of those stories told. Exactly. Right. Um, you hear the horror stories. It's unbelievable right. how much is given back by the realtor brand yep. and the unquantified stuff. Like you have 50 some odd light, 50,000 some odd licensees in this state, about half of them pay into the realtor brand. Yeah. The other half are what we call freeloaders <laughs> and they benefit from all the stuff we do here with the realtor R they, they pay nothing into the legislative lobbying, but they benefit from all the laws that we pass. Mm -hmm. They don't show up and do anything with, with, uh, um, the four by 400, whatever the thing was. Call them out, dude. Call them out. some odd thing or another. You know, it's like, well, where are you? Yeah. Because right. you're often the loudest, that the like you said. brand yeah. isn't doing what they're supposed to, and you ain't even in it. Yeah. It's like I got zero <laughs> patience for those kinds of people. Yeah. It, right. It's just unbelievable. And homeowners have no idea the benefit the realtors have exactly. brought to them. No. Mm -hmm. So, and you can't really, it, they all wouldn't understand it even if you told them. So you just, yeah. you just do it as a thankless thing. Like I pay my dues and I lobby and I do this stuff because I'm a good dude or a good gal, the public's never going to understand it. They're always going to think you're overpaid and underworked. Yeah, mm -hmm. and whatever. I think it was either... At least at a macro level. I think most of the time yeah. at a micro level, for the people who have worked with exactly. a they professional know. licensee, they're like, oh, okay, you went person. to my house, fixed yeah. a garbage disposal, met the carpet cleaner, yeah. you know, pulled my weeds. That is not what my commission agreement says I'm going right. to do. Right. But I, I did, anyway. you know, and I think a lot of times that people are, see some benefit out of that. But yeah. it's, that so I true. see that... that mentality more in the realtor brand than i do outside of it like it's a very giving community yeah, yeah i agree and killer leaders i mean like the people that run this organization the staff is great but they get paid for it you know mm -hmm. and it's like the other volunteers just do it because they're passionate and they care and they want people to retain whatever private property rights exist which yeah. are getting chipped away every day but um mm -hmm. yeah yeah. yeah, that's one thing that I think it was either Michelle or Patrick said, 
um, I can't remember, but it was a it was about that exactly the public perception of of what we do. And I'm just one of those people, I think, naturally that I don't really like talking about what I do because, in my honest opinion, I believe that I just do what I do, and I'm expected to regardless of how it's perceived or or what people say about it. And it's one of those things where mm-hmm. people genuinely don't understand. And there is a perception that you're just overpaid and you just show up and open doors, um, and that's it. And seeing what people have done behind the scenes has been so incredible. And and it's like we are the people or at least the organization that are protecting the consumers. I think often it's been seen that we're antagonistic to the consumers. We're kind of the sharks in the waters and the government's protecting you with the beautiful legislation. And it's like that has never been farther from the truth. And I'm not going to demonize government, even though they have their issues at, you know, state and federal levels for sure. Much of the government issues are the same issues we have here. Mm -hmm. The people who have a brain don't get involved in it. So the only people left are the (laughs) stupid. Yeah. And they're running it. And that's what's sad, though, is we are the ones who are protecting your private property rights. Like Mm -hmm. you said, a big, big, big part of those realtor dollars are just lobbying and legislation. Because I firmly believe personally that a lot of our issues begin and end with legislation when it comes to real estate and a lot of things. And so if we do not prevent bad legislation from coming in and if we do not keep bad legislation out, it's a huge problem. Yeah, sure, for us. Like, do I run a business and do I want to get paid? Absolutely, I do. But more importantly than that, like, if our industry is under attack, you are under attack. The people that I work for and serve. And that's a huge problem. People don't really see that, though. Yeah, overwhelmingly, mm-hmm. if the realtor wasn't between the public and the government, there would be substantially less private property. Yep. Yeah, totally. Their ability to transfer the taxes of which would be paid, like all of those things would be way, way different. Yeah, and then we were just talking about, if you don't mind sharing again, you had kind of a funny story about, um, since you do property management, about, I guess, the perception of real estate investments and how often, specifically with social media and, and the internet these days, people just think like, oh, people who own real estate are just these millionaires who don't care about the public and they just are kind of like slumlords. And having a little bit of background in property management and then also helping people sell their investments, seeing, A, can it be a good investment? For sure. Is it just free money all the time with no work? No, absolutely not. Definitely not. Do you want to talk about that? You don't have to. Yeah, yeah. I have no I just thought that was really funny. my opinion because mm-hmm. it's like oftentimes real estate investments are sold as the answer to every question, you know, and it's mm-hmm. like I just think that there needs to be a lot more discernment when it comes to what are you buying? Why are you buying it? When are you buying it? How are you buying it? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with it after you bought it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, oh, I have this thing and people tell me I'll make money if I rent it. And it's like, well, making money is one thing. Making enough money to make it make sense is an entirely different thing. Mm -hmm. And like, who are you buying it for? If you're buying it for cash flow today, ain't going to happen in this market area for the overwhelming majority of buyers yeah. if you buy mm-hmm. today and expect to rent today even if you stroke Solid. a check for it the roi sucks mm-hmm. so it's like your cash flow may make sense 20 years from now but it ain't going to be today exactly. you know and what is it Ooh, even going to be like worth that. 20 years from now no idea yeah. you know and then yep. people often think they made money on a house because they bought it for three and sold it for four and i'm like well yeah but you had a loan you paid 50 grand in interest Okay, so that took 50K off of your top there side. How much property taxes and insurance did you pay? Oh, that's right. You painted that wall, made this cool geometric thing on it, (laughs) slapped a roof on it, concreted it. You made what we call zero (laughs) dollars. You know, like just because there's a delta between buy and sell, it's what happens in the middle that makes a difference. And so many people, especially in like the self-managed world, don't don't even take it into consideration. Mm. They don't take in the fact that they drove there, that they had to buy an $80,000 car to get them there, you know? The house is vacant. They had utility bills. Someone smoked meth, burned crack, God knows what in the thing. Mm -hmm. Cost them money. And they just want to say, well, I paid this and sold for that. And therefore, I made money. Uh But most of these people are leveraged. Yeah, you have the corporate buyers. I despise them as much as anybody, frankly, because I think they're monetizing something that doesn't need to be monetized at the level that it needs to be monetized. Like, it's not really a stock. In my opinion, yeah. but that's how it's about being like treated. Corporate buyers buying up like residential. Real yeah, estate. when they come in and buy a neighborhood, 30, 40, 50 yeah. homes, you know, yeah. like I had an experience with that in Lorson Ranch. We, my guy bought a rental. Our predicted rent price at the time was around 2,400. Uh, there was a big transaction, 80 some odd single family homes sold to an investor. Ooh. Instantaneously, 80 homes 
went on the market, we ended up renting it for 25, 30% less than the, mm. you know, predicted rent income and took three, four months because you only have so much of an absorption rate. Wow. You know, if you're renting 10 homes a month in that area, your absorption rate is eight months. If you had 10 properties, it's one month. Now we got 80 of them. So it's yeah. like his days on market were way higher. Plus we had to knock down the price to make it more competitive. And it's like, so you got this one guy who kind of got eaten up because uh, a right. hedge fund ish type of thing came in. And I mean, I'm sure they'll make money in the long run, but I don't love that. That's the way that housing works. Yeah, and I um, even though I don't think regulation is always the answer, I think there should be some conversation about how, when, and how many, and what it looks like of in the certain area. Yeah, like, buying yeah. homes, and mm -hmm. I don't know what that looks like exactly. But um, yeah, you put that well. It's yeah. it, it's it is not the greatest investment ever. It is an investment, maybe, and it's kind of <laughs> like you, right. you know what you eat. Like you have an yeah. opportunity to put something good mm -hmm. or something bad in your mouth. Yep. You pick. Most of us pick bad, but with your money, you got something. To buy a house, buy a stock. I, you know, pick whatever it is, but buy it yeah. cash. If you're going to leverage it and hope to mm. make money, then buy it for your kids. That's fine. Like the second generation, you get stepped up bases when it transfers to the kids. You know, they don't want the thing anyways, but buy it for them and they'll sell it at some point and make some money. Yeah, mm -hmm. it definitely is a highly a specific idea. investment, just like all investments are. I personally choose to in invest in real estate in the small capacity that I have so far, just a in home ownership and then now having uh, rented out my place. It's it's one of those things that makes sense for me. But I think people look at that, like you said, as the end all be all of just you own a rental property. Now you're going to be rich month over month. No work like you just get your cash flow. And it's like all these buzzwords and all these hot topics. How many of these people are you listening to actually do what you say? And mm -hmm. then something you said earlier about like, OK, show me the P&L. Yeah. Like, show me what your actual expenses is. It are money in versus money out, and then let's actually look at that as an investment, like as a as a business. Does that really make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think real estate is bad. It's just not perfect for everybody all the time. Yeah, and well, like making those numbers on paper. Is and specifically helpful. because I think people are so. I guess, expectant or hoping that it is going to be that end all be all that they end up over leveraging just mm -hmm. so much and then or pour all of their savings into uh, a property or getting into a property. And it's just like any little expense that comes up. Now what? Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. You definitely have to be financially stable before you even get to the point of buying one. It's like even if you don't buy a cash, which I think is the only way to own real estate, but even if you don't buy a cash to spend all your cash for the down payment because your tenant's going to pay your mortgage every month and you're just going to capitalize on equity is a very false belief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one that many people fall in. And I mean, in this market, like a lot of people are what we call forced landlords. They bought a house with no money down two years ago. Mm -hmm. no, it's worth 40 grand less today. They got to pay us to sell the thing for them. They can't do it. Mm -hmm. So they dump it into property management and hope for bluer waters at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. But I think being conscious about it if if you're looking to invest money, it is an investment to be compared against other investments to see what it is and how it's going to perform and what the market area is that you're in. But I can tell you that the state right now very much believes that everybody who owns a home as a rental property is rich. <laughs> mm. And you should not have it because mm. you should give it to a tenant for free. And I just don't think that really works. Yeah, yeah. that's one of those things specifically that you know, being a part of public policy, hearing about all of the things going on when we're in session, propose things while we're out of session, both at the state and the federal level. It seems like as you go farther up, it seems to get worse, but mm -hmm. I digress. Um, the scariest thing is truly the the rights to do with your property what you wish to do. And of course, we don't want like Slum lords. We don't want people abusing. You know, uh, people. Yeah, but who even are that, I would it. argue, what is your choice? Like if. If your choice is tent on Fountain Creek or house is mostly junk, but a step up from a tent. That's true. It's I not mean, your house. You leave right. it up to the consumer to some of this stuff, because yeah. I would argue that even a house that is allegedly non-habitable can, can within that. a consideration of our laws today is probably better than sleeping on a bench on Tejon out here. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Mm -hmm. But you can't have that. So now there's this bigger delta again of every house must be maintained at this class A level, mm -hmm. but not we, everyone. You ain't got that, a budget, right? Yeah. yeah. So, welcome to the land of the homeless. Yeah. No, it's it's very difficult to, uh, from my understanding, 
to keep a property these days and then still make decisions for your own property and what's allowed in it. Yeah. And that's a little bit scary. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. But anyway, final thoughts. I want to hear the story. You said it was funny. Oh, yes. Um, the barbershop story. Oh, that was the story. Yeah, I just got approached by a gal while I was getting my, my hairs did. And she was, I don't know this person. I was just getting my hair cut. And she came up to me asking questions about, like, legislation. But I didn't realize that it was quite as accusatory or mean, I guess. As I, like, like hindsight's twenty twenty. So when I got to the end of the conversation, I was like, oh, why was that lady picking on me? There's a dude getting his hair cut here. But she just came up like, well, what legislation is is causing problems? And I was like, do you want bill numbers? Do you want concepts? Mm. You know, like, mm-hmm. I help negotiate lots of these bills with the CLLC, so I can tell you whatever you want to know. Well, just I don't understand. Like, you just tell me that, it, you know, this isn't working and that's not working. And I was like, well, you can't screen them the way you could. You can't require the same income that you could. You got the habitability things you're dealing with now. You got Animals. this. That what's that? Animals. Yeah, like yeah. Your ridiculous. your pet fees, like all these other mm. things, has been changed. And she's like, "Oh well, I don't have any of those problems." Well, Good for you. I'm glad you don't. I've managed thousands of them, and I do. So you are far smarter. <laughs> you should just buy my business from me today because you will be so much better at it than I will. But she was just like, "Oh well, you know, you kind of got to know the way around. You gotta, you don't have to rent to families and people with kids." I'm like, "Yes, you do. Yeah, you do. Those yeah. are called protected classes. You absolutely have to." Well, no, it's not. There's just ways. I'm like, lady, I'm not the Gestapo. (laughs) Whatever you do with your rentals is your problem. First off, what's your name? Uh, Right. But I'm telling you, if you want to follow the rules. Expose this lady. It's difficult. If you just, I was like, yeah, you get rich robbing banks too, I guess. But (laughs) that's illegal. (laughs) Like, don't do that. So I don't know. And then when I left, I was like, why was she being mean? I literally (laughs) don't even know this person. Yeah. haven't spoken a word to her in my existence, but she had it out for me. And, well, what can I say? I don't know, dude. She mm. was not having it. No. That's funny. Yeah. It was pleasure. Mm. Kind well, of. one of these days we'll have to uh, find her and take one of her classes. <laughs> Expose. Yeah. See what we Teach can, me. See what we can learn. Teach me, Mr. Miyagi. Maybe we'd be as rich I need as to she know is. the ways. So. Wax on, wax off. She knew them all. Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us. I yes, appreciate your you wisdom so and insight. Mm-hmm. And just on a personal level, like you being able to be accessible somebody I can lean on, reach out to, um, both for my personal business, but also for the volunteerism, for YPN, for PPAR. Um, I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. Like, YPN leadership, way more put together than it was 10, 12, 14 years ago. And because of people like you. Very unprofessional group. So, yeah, yeah, to see where it was and where it is now, I'm like, wow. Yeah, I mean, things It is really cool. It was. It takes a little bit of time, but yeah. eventually, like, you see the fruit of that, and it's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Especially, yeah. I think, something that's really cool is being in something long enough and being passionate about something and then seeing a younger, newer set of people be mm-hmm. just as passionate about it as you were. And that like, is cool, yeah. but that's then exciting. you realize that, like, old is now entering your vocabulary. It's like... Wait a sec. I shouldn't be old enough to like right. look at other people. Back in my day. Yeah, like, right. Hey. Like, oh, oh, when did that happen? Uh, clearly uh. recently. But no, I'm really glad you guys are a part of it and you're involved and you're doing the things that you're doing. I would tell everybody call to action, get involved, stay involved. Yep. Get involved. Get involved. Stay, stay involved. involved. Um, find time for it because this is your livelihood. And the people that I see most successful in this industry are the people who are consistently volunteering, involved at this board. Mm -hmm. They know what is happening. They take it seriously. It's not a part-time job. They're not a Burger King and working this on the weekends, which I get it. Sometimes you got to do that. But like this is a full-time business. It should be treated as such. And part of that is... This can, I, can I speak on that really quick, yeah, actually? Because I think there's people on both sides. There's always a, a scale. But when it comes to like part time jobs in real estate, first of all, no hate. You got to do what you got to do. Dude, you got family. You got to pay the bills, whatever. I'm not talking about that. But those people who willingly choose to hold a real estate license just so I can do some deals for family and then on the, you know, on the side, like work their other job, it's like, 
I, there's no elitism or pretentiousness behind it, but if you don't fully go into real estate, if you're not taking the time to educate yourself at PPR's classes, if you're not taking time to stay up to date on insurance, all on all the things that are tangential and essential to our industry and educating your clients to the best of your ability, I think you're honestly doing your clients, your business, your community, and everyone else around you a disservice because you are quite literally costing them money from the information you're not sharing with them. And that... Mm-hmm. I don't know if I would say I get passionate about, but it does frustrate me. It sounds me. like it, it, it like frustrates me a bit <laughs> because, um, you know, when I hear about deals that go sideways, it's rarely because somebody straight up did something wrong. Somebody was like, yeah, I have intent to withhold the mold or whatever. It's just because of negligence. It's because they didn't know. And I don't think there's an excuse in real estate for negligence. There are honest mistakes for sure, uh, but we should own up to them and handle that. But people that don't know about, oh, shoot, I didn't know they were going to build this behind your house. I didn't know that you were gonna, weren't were going to be able to get affordable homeowner's insurance. You should know. I you should be involved. That. Yeah. that is your job to know. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I didn't know I had to wake up. I didn't know I had to. I'm like, then no. Yeah. <laughs> that is what were the you thing doing the night you're before? supposed to know right. is yeah. to know. So I didn't know is a cop out. And it's exactly. like, yeah. And it's scary because earlier in my career, I knew everything. And I often say mm. the more I know or the more I learn, the less I know. Yeah. Because it's like, I have no idea. I take one class, they tell me this. I take one class, they tell me that. Yeah. You know, but that's then where your brain comes in and you make a professional exactly. decision. Sure. But at least it's like, I didn't know either of these things. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, like that's pretty bad. It's different to say, well, there's this opinion and this opinion and I pick this one. Yeah. As opposed to like, oh, I didn't know there was an opinion. And without into, it's stepping into places where you shouldn't, right? Because mm-hmm. as real estate agents, there are a lot of things that we are a part of that we are not fully knowledgeable or competent right. in. And for there example, we can't like... we even do. Like there's things we can't do. Like we can't, we, we yeah. can't, if we don't have an MLO license, we cannot talk about rates and finances and stuff to that degree. Mm-hmm. Great. I don't talk about those things, but you should know enough. You should have competent enough yep. partners to educate your clients on that. Because I never want to use the excuse... I can't talk about this or I shouldn't know about this. Cool. I can't talk about this in a legal capacity, but I'm going to get you with somebody who can. I'm going to make sure that you, as my client, I am actually doing my due diligence and withholding my or keeping my uh, fiduciary duty to you to educate you about this. That's Mm -hmm. important to me. Yeah. And I think you could be a part time agent with full time knowledge. You know, it's like, okay, I get you got to do something else to pay the bills right now. Yeah. But NAR has online classes. Um, lots of local real estate schools have online classes. And, I, mm-hmm. you know, not just to get your license, but continuing education. Maybe PPAR, exactly. they probably have hybrid classes. They so do. many. Yeah, There's so, so many. it's like yeah. that should be what you're doing after hours exactly. and so that you have that knowledge, even if it's not applied knowledge, you know, all day, every day, exactly. closing 50 transactions a year. Yeah, and to that point, too, I just keep going off on this because it's important to me. Like, I also think those other people who are just grind, grind, grind. If you're not in it 24-7, like, you have no life, mm-hmm. I get it, sure. But at the same time, to do that, to have that full-time knowledge, like you were saying, it doesn't take a lot. So both with technology and access and leverage that we have in this day and age, you can right. absolutely be a competent, helpful agent that is there for your clients, that knows the stuff, but isn't spending 80 hours a week doing it. You shouldn't exactly. be spending 80 and hours a week doing it. And you go like this. Oh, yeah, I met right? that Kyle guy at YPN. <laughs> yeah. I remember hey, dude, he was what pretty talking competent. About? Let yeah. me, uh, exactly. hey, Kyle, yeah, I, I, uh, oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Client, so uh, <laughs> well, let me tell you how that works. Exactly. You know? and there we go, just leverage the relationship from exactly. YPN. That's one thing I say on not only my buyer's consultations, but my listing presentations is if – Sometimes I say this. If there is ever a situation where I don't have an answer, I don't know, guess what? You're not just working with me. You're working with my team. You're working with my brokerage. You're working with my community. Now YPN. I will get an answer for you, and I will get back to you. I'm no longer embarrassed to say I don't know because guess what? I'm still learning. There's always Mm going to be something I don't know, and that's fine because guess what? Daniel might know. Nikari might know, and that's great because now I know. Yeah. Well, my dad said, like, you have agents who have been in the business for 20 years but they're still a first year agent. Mm-hmm. They just yeah. repeated their first year 20 times. Yeah. They never learned anything more. They never figured anything mm-hmm. else out. They just kept doing that. Yep. And That's you have agents guy. who have 20 years of depth and knowledge and experience nice. and they can draw on that and say, I remember 20 years ago, we were doing these types of loans. I haven't heard about them in a long time, but let me make some calls and see if they yeah. still exist. Exactly. Sometimes they do, you know, like assumptions, they weren't really a thing. 
for 10 years, 12 Coming years. Coming back, baby. And now assumptions are a thing again. Okay. But if you're an agent who doesn't even know that you have a VA loan and you don't mark it as an assumable, Disservice. you could have it's killed your client. Like exactly. sometimes for months, they're the only thing that was selling was VA yep. assumables. Yeah. So, yeah, knowledge is power. Isn't that what they say like in elementary school? Or something? <laughs> I don't know. It seemed yeah, like an elementary That was a topic. long time ago. So. But um, cool. I appreciate your expertise, your knowledge, your wisdom. Um, that being said, we have people like this at YPN. We have people like us at YPN. Mm -hmm. We want to help you. We're here for you. We were at your point at some point. Yep. And that's a cool thing. So join us. Second Thursday every month here at the PPAR downtown office. I'm Kyle Wong, your 2024 YPN Chair, Altitude Agents. I'm Nakari Wright, your 2024 YPN Co-Chair. And I'm Daniel Muldoon, Colorado Association of Realtors, YPN 2024 Chair. Yeah, And maybe. past PPAR Chair, but I don't remember what year, so sorry. Let's go. <laughs>